read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me welcome back lady listeners hey welcome back welcome back we have anna fury with the second installment of alpha ranger and we are so excited to share it with you but not yet (laughs) so (laughs) we're gonna get to it in a little bit i have some emails and stuff but i wanted to ask you we sort of talked about it a little bit before um we started recording earlier tell me about um your doctor experience when we were talking about because i was like you said maybe this is something i should share and so if you feel comfortable sharing it let's do it okay well about what has been about three weeks ago maybe four weeks ago i had a bad panic attack I didn't realize, I kind of realized at the time I had a panic attack and, but ever since then I could real I could feel the pressure on my chest. Like it wouldn't go away. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't get myself to do anything. I couldn't sleep. So I went to the doctor and it felt like I was doing the same. I've had the same doctor since I was like seven, except, or they've gone to the same practice since I was like seven. Mm-hmm. My doctor, doctor retired like seven years ago. I got this new guy. I want to call him a kid, which is disrespectful. <laughs> But he's like my age. Okay. But I go in and, you know, I've done this dance with him before. You know, I'm like, I'm not sleeping. Da 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 da. -da. And he's like, okay, let's try this. And I realized the prescription he gave me, I call him back, I message him. And I'm like, this is this prescription the psychiatrist gave me before that didn't work, that made my head hurt. And he's like, okay, I'm going to put you on Ambien. And the Ooh. Ambien would put me down, but then I wake back up a few mm-hmm. minutes later or a few hours later or whatever. But so I request, I'm like, I'm not, I feel like I'm going insane at this point. Like I feel, mm-hmm. I literally feel like I'm going insane for this first week, like my mind and the pressure that I'm feeling and I'm trying to, I'm communicating it through here, through the messages or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then he's like, oh, okay, maybe let's see if we can get you in like Friday. And this is like Wednesday. Oh shit. And I'm like, Oh my God. I'm going to like, no, this isn't it. (laughs) That's not it. Like, and so then I, I'm just so worked up at this point Mm -hmm. that I kind of snap back and they get me in the next day, Thursday, Mm -hmm. I come in, I get in there and I'm explaining to him once again, I said, there is a pressure on my chest. And I said, well, after I talked to my psychologist, mm-hmm. she kind of told me, my therapist, she was like, when I had my panic attack, I guess when it exploded out of me, I pulled back and I can visually remember, like I could see myself, like I was behind myself trying to grab everything that was exploding out of me and pull it back in. But when I got it back, it was like I didn't get it back down. Mm-hmm. I, I got it only to my chest, right? Mm-hmm. So the pressure has been there for over a week at this point. And I'm in there and this motherfucker's like, we're going to run an EKG on you. Like maybe you had a heart attack. I'm like, oh, fuck it. I'm going to murder you. <laughs> So he, I'm like, whatever. It's not funny, but I'm just like, I can't. I know. I'm like, I'm like, doing. I'm like, run your fucking, you can't, mm-hmm. run your test, do what you're going to do. And so mm-hmm. I lay there, they do the test, and she's like, well, I'll have the doctor come back in and let you know um, your results. And when the nurse walks out, I just like fucking lose it in this room by myself. Like, I just, like, I can't breathe. And I'm sobbing. And he comes in and he just gives me this, like, I don't know what to do with you kind of look. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I was just like, and this only like, because I knew this is what was going to happen. He was going to come back. Mm -hmm. He was going to say the test was fine. Yeah. That maybe Mm. we should try. I don't know. I just knew he wasn't going to solve the problem. Yeah, or take it seriously. Yeah, like it wasn't going to be. And then I, Mm -hmm. when he comes back and I see that look on his face that I'm like, you know, maybe it's the wrong thing. I'm staring at this white man yeah. in his little suit, looking at me with these eyes. I'm like, he thinks I'm a hysterical woman. Yes, he does. Yeah. <laughs> he thinks I'm being hysterical and I can't explain to him what I, and that, and you know what the next thing out of their fucking mouth 
I was like, well, maybe you should go down to um, the psychiatric hospital. Oh, my God. And I was like. This is his solution? This is his solution. They were like, they can do a better evaluation. And I'm sure they probably can. And I'm just like, I just, I, I need. I am mo- so like irritated on your behalf. I'm trying to explain to him. I was like, I just need you to give me, I just have to calm down. I was like, I feel like my foot is on a ledge mm-hmm. and I'm trying to grab it. And I was like, and if you guys can get me to just feel better for a second, mm-hmm. then I will do all the evaluations in the world. You yeah. want me to do? I'll do all the steps. I was like, I just have to sleep and I have to calm down. They're like, well, we're just not sure what. And I was just like, fuck you guys. And I left. Oh, wow. And I walked out and I left and I was just like, I can't. I can't. It's just, I don't even, even now, like mm-hmm. it was my therapist that had to like, scramble to try to find some kind of body to reach out quickly and help me because even at the doctor's office they're like well even if you want a new psychiatrist there's like a two-month wait Mm -hmm. and I'm like you guys are making this worse yeah yeah (laughs) like I don't know what to do with you guys but man they put me on because I still had some Xanax, but mm-hmm. it makes me, I'm taking these mild doses, but I hate it because mm-hmm. it makes me tired, but I still have more appointments, but it was just such like an epiphany, a moment of like, you really have to like, maybe not just accept the doctors given to you. Yeah. Cause I just, when I got transferred over to him, it was just like, I don't know. And I still like feel like when I was staring at him that they were just like, I was a crazy person. But that's, that's what they thought of you, that you were crazy. <clears throat> yeah. I, was like, I hate that. Imagine if someone came in and when they were like suicidal, you know, and what, and felt the way you felt, you know? Yeah. And, like, well, they asked me those questions. I never felt suicidal. I just felt mm-hmm. Not myself. I still don't feel myself completely. Mm -hmm. But But what if someone felt the way you felt, but they didn't understand that that was suicidal? You know what I mean? Like, what if they were having the same feelings, but couldn't verbalize Mm -hmm. that they were suicidal and he looked at them like they were in a hysterical way? I I just can't get over the look he gave me. Like, I was just like, the way he was staring at me and I'm staring back at him. And I was just like, this is making it worse. Like that, that that feeling of I've got to get out of here. I don't know what he probably could have said at me, said to Mm -hmm. me then at that moment that didn't have already that panic of I've got to get away from you. Yeah. Was my thought. I was like, I got to get away from you. I got to get, I got to get out of this building. Uh, I got to get away from all of you. (laughs) You know, and I think I've realized too, the older I get and hearing things like this too, it just reminds me that you have to self advocate. Like as a, as a person, Mm -hmm. you have to look out for your own, your best interest, because someone like him is not going to do it. No, you know, like it's like you have to, you have to recognize when you need help. And especially for women, I think that's difficult, but like stopping and going to see him and be like, no, I need to see someone now, you know, talking to your therapist saying, I need to talk to someone now. I need to sleep. I need this to happen now. Like being able to say that and verbalize it is great because you did get people to move. It wasn't this asshole, but you know, you got someone in your corner to look out for you. You know, one thing that's taught me is because before now, you know, I've been in a little bit of a rut, but What triggered me was so small. What do you mean? With like your panic attack? Yeah, with that first panic attack. And now I keep having them. But the first panic attack was the simplest thing. I've lost, I'd lost a cat or whatever. And I would just gone around this curb or whatever. And I didn't realize there was a road. This is what triggered me. I did not realize there was a road that went to this whole other area a mile and a half from my house. Okay. And I get out there and I'm trying to, I'm looking around and I'm like, what is all this? Where did this come from? I didn't know this was here. And then there was this feeling of there's so much stuff. Like I could never cover this area. I couldn't 
get to this mm -hmm. area. I didn't know this was here. And then an explosion of uncontrollability is what it felt like. Like, yeah. I mm -hmm. can't control things. Something this big. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. these are, it's, it's right here. I didn't see it. How did I not see this? This is right here. Mm -hmm. And it's the strangest, smallest thing to mm -hmm. trigger you into a panic attack. I don't know if that's small, but you know, it's, but you know it's what I mean? It wasn't it. like, yeah. you know, something <clears throat> like before the last panic attack I had had years and years ago was because I thought I, my organs moved around inside of me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you can laugh about that now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I yeah. My organ had mm -hmm. slipped and I had a panic well. attack. Mm -hmm. But it's just interesting the things that, or, I guess what I'm trying to say is just because you think you're going along fine mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean it's true. If you've suffered with mental health, I think one of the biggest things that you have to remember, and I know people may not want to say it this way or hear it this way, is you're sick. Mm -hmm. You're always sick. You might feel better today. But you have to remember that you have, that's in you. There's no getting rid of it. It's part of who you are and you need to make sure you're really checking in with it and making sure it's not slipping more than you're realizing it's slipping. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like. I mean, I get what you're saying. I don't know that it is necessarily a sickness for some people, but maybe that's how it feels with yours. You know, it feels like this will always be inside of you, but I don't know necessarily that it's, you know. I, I don't yeah, know. I know sickness yeah. isn't the right word, mm -hmm. but that but is what, what you it, mean. sometimes it feels like. I have to remind myself my brain isn't necessarily like everybody else's. Yeah. I mean, there's other people like me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like, it's like there is a darker part or I call mm -hmm. it there's a sickness that lives inside of me that yeah. I have to yeah. make sure that mm -hmm. it's almost like a disease that I have to keep into check like yeah making sure that you're getting what you're supposed to be getting or is it mm -hmm. you know what I mean if you neglect it and not take or do what you're supposed to do it starts to get bigger and mm -hmm. you like hives break out or whatever you know what I mean yeah. it starts yeah. to grow again mm -hmm. or come to the surface and you're like oh whoa 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 gotta pull it mm -hmm. back or do what I'm supposed to be doing to keep that mm -hmm. medically mentally okay yeah I think this is a great reminder to like you know anybody if you're you know suffering emotionally like you have to look out for yourself with this you have to reach out to people you have to talk to someone you know, because there, you know, there will be people who you think like in a position of authority that are either a doctor or a therapist or whatever that maybe think they know best. And that might not be the case. You know, even no. someone yeah. as educated as your, your physician, I mean, obviously he wasn't equipped to handle, you know, your situation. Yeah. So it's good that you were able to, you know, find someone that could help. But, you know, it's just a reminder for people, you know, that just keep looking out for yourself with that kind of just stuff. You have yeah, to just do mm -hmm. mentally check in with yourself, I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, know. I, you know, it's, it, yeah, we've talked about therapy and stuff for a long time, but you know, I think benefiting from having someone who knows your story, I think that that's a big deal to me, at least to have someone that knows my full story. Yeah. That, you know, when I'm struggling or I'm slipping or I have something that hurts that I want to talk about, you know, I have someone who knows everything that can listen to it without judgment. I, like I think the, that's a big part. I think one of the things I like boast about therapy sometimes is them explaining things to me, like the mm -hmm. way you think. Because I'm like, well, you do that because of this. And I'm like. But I'm like the my sister gets brought up. I'm like my sister does not bother me anymore. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. make me upset. I'm not angered by her. And she's like, well, no, your brain is dumb. <laughs> and she's like, in the frontal lobe, your sister created an, an out of control experience for you. You had a no control over your life in a time of your life. So at any moment, your brain remembers that. You may not be upset about that moment. But your brain remembers the anxiety of it. So now mm -hmm. anytime something feels out of control, mm -hmm. it triggers that feeling inside of you. 
from back then. Even if you're not upset about it now, mm-hmm. the brain remembers. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's just interesting to hear those things. Mm-hmm. I don't know. To have it broken down like that. I understand. Like, I get it. Because sometimes you just need someone to explain it in the right way. And 10 people could tell you the same thing. But only one person can maybe make you understand it, you know? Yeah. And that's what it takes. So, all right. I'm going to read some emails. Let's do that. Um, This one was a follow-up to an email um, that we had before, but I cannot remember what the email is about. So I'm going to read this one and see if it jars our memory. Okay. Okay. Hey, ladies, as promised, more details. Okay. So I do remember when she says, I met my husband, or she says his name, but I'm not going to say it. When I was 13, however, I didn't know that then. You see, he has a twin brother, and I mean, they were identical enough. I didn't realize that there were two of them. I moved into town in 1991 as a freshman. My husband graduated that year, and we had a few mutual friends. In 1993, a couple of our friends decided we need to officially meet. We started hanging out and officially started dating that summer. Don't worry, I was legal. I was 16, soon to be 17, and he was 20. The first time we kissed, we had been hanging out at a local beach with friends. He was waiting for someone in the car while we said goodbye. He decided to stand up through the sunroof and yell, you kiss her, I will. Oh, that was her husband that said it. Um, She said, my husband was in the car while I said goodbye to the other guy. Um, Oh, okay. He said, you kiss her or I will. Can you say, no pressure. He said, I love you first while we were dancing in the rain. We were engaged my junior year and married two years after my graduation. We are still married and have two amazing kids. You ladies are awesome. P.S. Um, my husband loves Leah's voice. Well, I love him. Um, <laughs> hold on. No, I want to look this up because she sent me an, a message. I should have looked this up sooner. I'm sorry. She sent me a message and then she said, um, well, here's the update. And I was like, okay, well, do you think you could like me email it to me so I don't forget? And then I fucking forgot. So <laughs> I know, I'm gonna have to look it up. I can't remember what oh, it was it now. Goes. Oh my god. Okay, hold on. That was May. I don't even know. I'm so sorry. I should have like had all this up, but I don't. Okay, so this is from the Read Me Romance. She said, Hey, you just read my email. I was she just says I was 17. I was married after I graduated. I will write another email and detail it for you. Love you girls. I can't, I don't even, I can't remember. It was something about she like met her husband or something. And then I was, she didn't say her age. And I was like, oh my God, how old were you? How long have you been together? I need to know these details. And she, she wrote back. And now I don't know. I'm going to have to listen to another episode and then bring this back up again. I'm so sorry. But she sent a follow-up and I thought that was so nice. So I read it and now I don't know what the fuck it's a follow-up to. All right. So this one is entitled, meant to write this email a couple of years ago. Hey, ladies, my name is Mary. Oh, I guess we're just going to say it. All right. I'm from Central Canada, and I first started listening to your podcast in 2019. I'm sure you hear this a lot, but so often it feels like I'm hanging out with you gals and laughing along. If it, if I was on the bus listening, I hold in my lap and end up smiling like an idiot and relating to so much of what you talk about. I've been meaning to write this email for a while now. I blame COVID and... Mm, and some and that leave me for and some and Matt leave for distracting me. I don't know what that is. I work at a public library. Oh, you got a great job. I love it a lot. There's a patron that comes in from time to time. Oh, I wish it was more often. And I think there should be a book written with a character like him. Um, he's older, late forties, and is always dressed in black, black jeans, black lace up vans, and a plain black t shirt. He's handsome, hair is almost black. It's long but doesn't reach his shoulders and is always slicked back. He always has a serious look on his face. And when he walks into the library, he smiles when I'm helping him. I always try to talk to him a little more, but I get excited and intimidated. So I end up getting overwhelmed. The closure during COVID and leave has derailed my progress. So I'm starting over again and trying to talk to him. I'm not exaggerating, but this guy is so striking. Whenever he walks in and out of the library, he could be a vampire. LOL. Q scene from Twilight when the colons enter the school cafeteria. <laughs> I'm getting distracted again. I haven't even mentioned the best part. The first time he came into the library, I checked his I checked his books out 
to him and all of them were recipe books. My stupid boss, mm -hmm. ugh, that's a whole other story. But think Michael Scott's personality from The Office, but in real life and less whimsical. <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, my stupid boss was working with me. He usually talks to everyone. So I asked him about that person. I just helped my stupid boss says, isn't he cool? He's such a cool guy. I've never heard a grown man say that about another grown man. And that might be the only time I've liked my boss during that minute. <laughs> then stupid boss continues to tell me that the, that the patron works as a chef on a train. I never would have guessed that he seemed like a cool guy, but now he's even cooler. <laughs> I finally remembered to write this email because he came in today and I was caught off guard as usual. And my mind went blank when trying to talk to him. All I could think to say was, uh, duh, this is good. <laughs> I have the cookbook <laughs> of Portuguese recipes. Uh, maybe it's just me and probably my stupid boss too, but I wouldn't mind reading about cool, handsome gourm. I wouldn't mind reading about a cool, handsome gourmet chef that works on a train and goes to a library when he's in town to get recipe books. And the librarian working there drools over him and his books. Okay, this turned into a long email. Before I end this, I want to say thank you for keeping me company as well as entertaining and empowering me and others out there. I appreciate all the hard work you ladies put into the podcast. Thank you. That's, That's adorable. sweet. But That's a great concept, though, for a story. This one isn't like that one. Like, he's not a chef or whatever, but... Casey Mint, who she's been on the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Cassie, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cassie Mint. She has a series called um, that's got like the shrink, the coach, and the tutor, the mm -hmm. bodyguard. But the tutor, that kind of reminds me of, and he's a virgin. He dresses mm -hmm. real like dark. He has a cane from something. He's like works out and built, but something happened to his leg. And the other girl is kind of like spunky and she's got to get a mm -hmm. tutor and it's him that comes in. Cause he works for the university. It's like something he has to do. Mm -hmm. And he's got like that dark ominous, what she explained. Ooh, I like that. And that's called the tutor. And okay, I read that so like Cassie three weeks the tutor. ago. Got or it. Something like that. So All the right. whole series is adorable, mm -hmm. but that one, when you started reading her email, it made me mm -hmm. think of that book, The Tutor. Okay. All right. We'll do. Sorry. I swear like my entire family is trying to mess with me tonight. <clears throat> okay. Next one. Um, this one's entitled Confession Time. Hey, y'all. I hope I'm not too late, but I figured you'd still love this confession. For starters, my name is She Who Shall Not Be Named, and here is my <laughs> confession. I started taking edibles recently because I found out certain psychedelics are, le are legal in Texas. Eat responsibly. Anyways, in my journey to figure out how much of a lightweight I am, I had one night where the gummies hit me so hard I almost came off dry humping the air. Okay, thanks. Bye. That sounds amazing. I would like to know your dosage and what brand this is. <laughs> I've never done great on edibles. Like they just make me hungry. Except one time my husband brought me one home one night and it was like half of a milky dud one. And I was out like a light. I hear there's different strains for stuff. I would love to know what that one was that he brought me. Cause we've gone to Vegas and I've tried different ones. All I ever get is hungry. <laughs> and I don't need help being hungry. I got that all on my own. You got that unlocked. I or giggly. I would love to get giggly. I don't even get mm -hmm. that. Oh wow. Um, there's two strains that we eat in uh they're like edible gummies. And the indica is the one that's I think the one that's like there's one that's giggly and one that's sleepy. And I can't remember which one's which, like they're labeled on the bottle. Because I've done them with people mm. before that have like made them and like I've sat down and ate like more than them of their own and they're mm -hmm. tripping balls and I'm sitting here like this like mm -hmm. you got something to eat around here well and I've never had it like you've talked about before like in candy form I've never yeah it was had candy that before form. yeah but at the I, same time I think mm -hmm. I don't know I think there's something wrong with my brain because one time I did shrooms Mm -hmm. And everybody was tripping really bad. And I remember looking down and seeing the tile move. Mm -hmm. And I like closed my eyes for a second. And I was like, that is impossible, Melissa. <laughs> it is physically impossible. And when I opened my eyes back, nothing else. I didn't see anything else move. It was like my brain was like, that's you are not doing that. <laughs> 
I think a lot of it, so I looked it up just so I was sure. It's stevia and indica. So there's sativa and indica, sorry. Um, there are two different kinds. Uh, they have like, you can compare them or whatever. Indi and indica is the one that's overall, it's a body high. It's for relaxation. It can stimulate your appetite. It helps with sleep and pain. Um, those are the ones we take. Like if we've been working in the yard all day and I want like, I know three Advil aren't going to do it. I'll hit one of those because I know I'm going to feel better and I'm going to sleep like a rock. But I can only take five milligrams. They come in 10 milligram gummies. I have to cut that in half. That's too fucking much because I'll get too high and I'll do the same thing where I'll just see shit moving. But the other one is the sativa. And that's the one where it's like it's in your head. Um, it's euphoric. Uh, you get a ton of energy from it. Like that's the one. So when I got my tattoo, like mm -hmm. my huge one, yeah. I asked her, I was like, oh, should I, like, I have these gummies. Can I take these before I come? And she was like, absolutely not. Because she said, you will hyper focus on the oh. pain taking those. She was like, yeah, you definitely want a Xanax. You want something that's going to knock you out. Like make something that makes you chill. She was like, edibles like this or weed in general will make you hyper focus. So she was like, it's not good for that kind of thing. I, so, I, I can see that when, mm -hmm. now that you say that, cause like I said, anytime I've ever tried to do like marijuana or the shrooms, mm -hmm. I grow very serious. Like mm -hmm. I'm like, nope. Like my brain does not want to allow, mm -hmm. I'll just focus in on something so that mm -hmm. it doesn't try to, mm -hmm. I don't know. Let go. I definitely think it has to do with the strain. So there's, those are the two strains. So I think it would probably be a good indication of the strain and how much you take. Mm -hmm. So for me, like uh, I'm a five milligram indica kind of girl and oh, no. I, I'm a, I love those. I'm a 10 milligram ambient bitch to get me down. And that, <laughs> See, that only takes like me you. down for like four or five hours. See, and I'll take uh, the times I've taken ambient, I've taken a half of one and it's good for about four or five hours. And I, I will not take any more than that because I know it will fuck with my sleep. Like it, I'll have, oh have it, like a drug induced coma, which is so not sleep. That's, I forgot. I never even told you the story. So the first night they put me on Ambien, right? I get mm -hmm. the Ambien. I have slept maybe five to six hours in three or four days. Mm -hmm. Shit you not. And I'm like, I, and I look up, I'm like, what is the max dose of Ambien you can take? Cause I know mm -hmm. it can be hard to hit me sometimes. Like I said, mm -hmm. with drugs, yeah. my body just like resists for some mm -hmm. reason. Probably something to do with control, panic mm -hmm. attacks, whatever. Yep. <laughs> the mind so I, is a crazy thing. <laughs> the body is a crazy thing. So mm -hmm. I look it up. I'm like, medically, what can I take here? I take it. I take it. I lay down. And I think it was the combination of lack of sleep because lack of sleep can make you feel drunk. Mm -hmm. You can stumble and dizzy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm going to read. So maybe I'll start to like fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And then I for, I fell asleep and I did. I slept for like eight hours. But then I forgot because the next day I opened my phone. I was taking a mm -hmm. bath and I was like going through my stuff and I went to clear out my tabs and I seen my search history. And <laughs> I had and then it all came flooding back to me that I was Googling ambient hallucination, ambient. My phone looks like it's melting. What? Ambient. And then I remember oh that I was reading <clears throat> and you know, the page is white. Mm -hmm. I felt like when I'd go to flick the page mm -hmm. that I could pull it off. Mm -hmm. Like I could pull the corner of the phone screen of the page <laughs> off the phone uh, that's right and i was like trying to that was the only time i think mm -hmm. i ever hallucinated i think it was because lack of sleep yeah, yeah plus a thing but i i completely forgot till i seen my own search history that i was mm. googling ambient hallucinating phone screen <laughs> melting ambient yeah. hallucinating snowing inside my phone oh my god <laughs> See, I've had that sort of euphoric, like, um, like not melty, but like colors and waves and stuff when I've taken shrooms. But again, that's something where it's like, you just want to do a small dose. If you want a belly giggle, you do a stem and a cap, call it a day. That's it. Yeah. Some, like, I think people just, I don't know. I, I've always been around people who are very careful with that kind of thing. They're like, they're not the ones that are like, let's get fucked up. They're the ones like, how do you want to feel? Yeah. And that's the person I want to get high with when I they would, say, how high do you want to get? I think I would get high best, like, if I was at, like, my parents' house. 
Because you feel safe there? Yeah, I'd be like, okay, dad, I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And you're going to like, watch out. Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's probably you trying to control your environment again, though, too, you know? (laughs) Yeah. You know, but I mean, for anybody listening, if you want to try them like those, the, and I'm in North Carolina, we cannot purchase these here. So we've had like when my husband's gone on, he went on a business trip to Colorado and brought back like a suitcase full of gummies <laughs> because okay. like you can bring them home. I mean, you know, you purchase them legally. So. I don't know. I think my my husband has a friend. They come in like Skittles and yeah, we don't fuck Gushers. with those because those are like those are the kind of shit where you get super fucked up on. That's not like I don't want that. I want to get a little high and take a nap. That's all. That's I want. what all I want too. I just want to, a little high. And then you need to get you need to get high. the Kana. The it's like it's K A H N A. How get come my doctor half- didn't prescribe me that? Well, it's not legal in Missouri yet. I'm sorry to say. Even. <laughs> Not even a doctor's prescription? No, I don't think so. I mean, maybe, but you, where would you go buy it? You know, like it's not legal in your state. So, but maybe you probably have medicinal. I'm sure they have medicinal marijuana, but the people they give that to, again, they're going to give you a joint and it's going to put you on your fucking face. It's going to be the strongest Mm -hmm. shit they've got. Like, I just grew up where marijuana was always around. Like, it wasn't, my parents didn't smoke, but everybody always smoked marijuana growing up. I didn't. I just don't like the smell of smoke, but Mm -hmm. I feel like I could get it easily. Yeah, you probably could, but you're not getting the right thing, though. That's the thing. It's like, until you go to a shop that sells, like, proper, you know, like, weed, THC. Like, Like in Vegas. I mean, yeah, you could go there, but don't get like the fun, the funny ones, you know, don't get like the candy and stuff. Get like an actual one that's going to be like, okay, I just need the scummy and just this, <laughs> just chill. <laughs> so, I mean, those are the ones that I, I do the best on. Like I've done, you know, weed and stuff before, done drugs where it was like, I wanted to feel fucked up, but I don't ever like that 10 minutes in. So mm-hmm. like, that's why I've just learned to just take the little bit. And chill. Take you can line. always take more. You can't put it back. That's true. That's <laughs> my brother-in-law used to tell me. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, like, I, I am a big proponent of the marijuana for recreational uses, but also to microdose because I think, you know, I've known people who have microdosed shrooms for years and they're, they have a great, like, that's their, their baseline on microdosing shrooms is like every, like, uh, what is it? The, the drug to, uh, for, I can't remember what the name of the drug is, but it's the one that like people take for, you know, depression or bipolar or something like that. It's like the one that sends dopamine. you up and down. Yeah. But I guess, I don't think that's it, but, um, cause that's what your body produces. But like, oh, I thought you were is, saying it like pr- pr- made it produce more. Yeah. I mean it can, but it also just levels you out. So if you have like the manic or depressive personalities and that kind of thing, like the person that does it, she takes like a micro dose of shrooms. And it's just over the years, that's just mellowed her out completely. She doesn't have those manic ups and downs because she's able to control it that way. So I'm, I'm all for it. If you can find a drug that does that, whether it's, whether it's done by a pharmacy or if it's grown from the earth, whatever you want to take that makes you happy, go for it. Um, I'll read one last email real quick because I thought this one was really sweet. Um, it was actually sent to Alexa Riley and you forwarded it to me. I wanted to read it. And it said, hi, Leah and Mel. I just finished listening to Unexpected Claim on the Read Me Romance podcast. I couldn't remember the email for Read Me Romance, so I'm sending it to you here. Oh, my God. This is possibly my favorite of your books. It was seriously, seriously sexy. I was sitting in my garden pulling weeds and listening to the podcast, and I got so turned on. Very weird location to have such feelings. But anyways, haha. Great book. Thank you for your books and the podcast. So I thought that was really sweet. I thought so it was really sweet, yeah, too. Yeah, that's when cute. I got it. But then I'm awkward and I don't know what to say back, so I just send it to you. Well, I just I read it online, so there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she'll hear it. Maybe so. I don't. I didn't say your name just in case. Um, so we have the second installment of um, Anna Fury's Alpha Ranger. I wanted to read her book by it or her author by it. I forgot to read that on Tuesday's episode. Anna Fury is a North Carolina native, fluent in snark and sarcasm, tiki decor, and aficionado of phallic plants. Visit her on Instagram for a glimpse into the sexiest wiener wallpaper you've ever seen. If you know, you know. I know, bitch, because I've seen it. And her, I don't know what room it is in her house, but she has wallpaper that's really cool. And there's like hidden dicks in it. 
That's amazing. It's, it is incredible. Anyway, she writes, anytime she has a free minute, walking the dog, in the shower, on the toilet, the voices in her head wait for no one. When she's not furiously henpecking at her computer, she loves to hike and bike and get out in nature. She currently lives in Raleigh, North Carolina with her Mr. Wright and three-year-old Tornado and two-year-old lovely, lovely old dogs. Anna loves to connect with readers, so visit her on her social medias and check out her website. We'll have all that linked down below. Um, I want to mention real quick before we go to the second half, too, to check out Noir. That's her dark Omegaverse that's reading out. Jul uh, it's releasing July 12th, and her pre-order's up on it now. Um, there is, uh, oh, the it's the first in the new dark shifter romance, that one noir, so check it out. Um, it also is the one that has the dual covers, like the sexy and discreet. Um, and also, the world that this book is set in on the podcast, The Alpha Ranger, um, it's a set in her new series that she just finished, The Alpha, Com the Alpha Compound. So that's a dystopian megaverse, and the whole series is up. So you can find that on that's her website. Nice. So if yeah. you like get a taste of this and you like it, mm -hmm. then you can go back and read the whole complete series. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, get it up there. So, all right, listen to the second installment of oh, Alpha Ranger. It's in a Thatcher. I thought for half a second about trying to convince Liv that she's got a lot of life ahead of her, and Madrigata Springs might get boring for an adventurous soul like her. But at the end of the day, she's right. She's a grown-ass woman, and she knows what she wants. Zero to sixty it is. I'm tall enough as an alpha that if she holds the pocket pussy on the countertop, it'll be the perfect height for me to fuck. Gripping her thighs, I scoot her back and direct her to place the toy between her legs. When I fuck it, it'll feel like I'm fucking her, and I want her ready for me. Because after we're done with this, I'm taking her on every surface of this house. Liv's heartbeat gallops in her chest as I guide the toy between her thighs. Hold this tight, baby girl. She nods, big green eyes staring up at me in wonder. Bringing my hands to my shirt, I unbutton it and toss it onto the table. My eyes never leave her, but she drinks me in greedily. It's understandable. Becoming an alpha made me seven feet of stacked muscle. She's not immune to that, clearly. Liv's jasmine scent unfurls as Slick wets her jeans. She's too turned on to notice it's pooling underneath her on the countertop. Reaching into a drawer, I pull out a bottle of lube and hand it to her. You be in charge of this. She sucks in a deep breath but watches as I unbutton the top of my jeans. I'm hard as a rock watching her watch me. Live in real life is better than any fantasy I've ever had, any daydream I've stroked myself to. When I slide my zipper down, I reach into my pants and pull my cock out, shimmying the jeans down my big thighs until they hit the pine floors. Liv's face is a mask of shock as I run both hands along my length and let out a groan. I'm already dripping pre-cum, far more than I ever did as a normal man, but I suspect alphas produce more of it to prepare omegas to take our larger size. Liv is clearly wondering about that, if the skeptical look on her face is any indication of her thoughts. What's on your mind, Liv? I purr as I stroke myself again, stepping closer to her, close enough to touch the tip of my dick to the pocket pussy. Green eyes find mine again, and she smiles, a breathtaking smile that sucks the air out of the room. All I can focus on is her beautiful mouth and her smell and the parted thighs that beckon for my attention. I'm thinking I should have expected a seven-foot man to be proportional, but I'm wondering about fit, to be honest. She sounds nervous. Leaning in, I take her hands off the pocket pussy and put them on my cock, reveling in the feel of her soft palms. I help her stroke me with two hands, gathering the pre-cum as she gasps. We're gonna fit just fine, I reassure her. You'll be so ready by the time I'm done with you, you'll be begging to try riding this cock. I promise I'll take good care of you, all right? Liv pants softly as she takes over, running her fingertips along my length, tickling the vein that throbs along one side. I want to throw my head back and just feel her, but I can't stop looking at her. Crowding into her space, I wrap one hand through her long blonde waves and tug her head back hard. She grunts, the noise turning into a whine as I drag my teeth up her skin, relishing the way it turns red under my attention. 
Nipping my way back down, I pull her t-shirt up over her head and get my first glimpse at a bra that barely contains her full breasts. I pant as I dip my head and pull one taut nipple between my teeth. Liv jumps, hips rocking against my sex toy, still placed between her thighs. Want you. I want to see you, Thatch. She whispers as I nip at her other breast, eager to experience every inch of her. But she doesn't want slow exploration. She wants zero to sixty, and I'm hella distracted by her beautiful, creamy skin. She grips me hard, directing me back to the sex toy, and we both suck in a gasp as we watch the tip disappear inside with a slurpy wet noise. Oh God, I've never seen anything this hot. Liv groans as I rock out and back in again, shaking the countertop with the force of my thrust. She gasps as I lean over her neck, dragging my teeth up the erotic expanse of shoulder on display for me as my pace quickens. Squeeze the toy, little Omega. I snarl as the cilia on the inside stroke my length until I'm near mad with desire. Liv's unique scent wraps me up tight as I gnash my teeth. When she bites her way up my neck, I bellow out a needy roar and fuck the toy with hard, desperate strokes. She wraps one arm around my neck and hovers her lips over mine as my breath comes in labored gasps. I want you all over me, she whispers, and I explode. Lightning flashes down my spine as I open my mouth to sink my fangs into her shoulder. At the last minute, I hold back. That's a zero to a thousand move. But as orgasm barrels through my body, I can barely think around the blistering, blinding heat. When the pleasure begins to subside, I chuckle into Liv's neck and nip my way along it as she sucks in a deep breath. My God, Thatch, is that normal? I was woefully unprepared. For which part? I tease as I stand straighter, the toy still tickling my cock. I could go again, right now, just looking at her perched on my countertop. Liv's green eyes dart down, and when I follow them, my chuckle turns into a deep belly laugh. Her thighs and the toy and the lower half of her shirt are coated in my release. It drips all over her hands as she releases the toy, looking back up at me. I'm not sure what I read in her gaze. Concern? Surprise? Heat? Everything about fucking an alpha is more, little Omega. I purr, leaning in to lick my way along her lower lip as she sinks into my touch. Just imagine what it would be like for me to sink deep inside you, make you shatter all over me. A shudder racks Liv's frame as she takes her hands off the toy, green eyes locked onto mine. I need to find out, Thatch. I've been thinking about it since the day we met. Tell me more, I command as I slide my dick out of the toy and head to the sink, tossing it in and grabbing a towel. I cross the kitchen and set the towel between her thighs, but it's no use. Her clothes are coated in spend. Give me these clothes, baby girl. I'll wash them for you. And I'm going to wear what? I guess I should just prance around your house naked? She sasses me with a big grin on her face as I lean in and plant a tender kiss on her plump lips. Naked is the idea. Plus, you've got under things, I assume. Liv's cheeks turn bright pink, then red as she nibbles her lower lip. Realization dawns on me. You don't have under things. I've got a bra on, of course. Otherwise, I'd be slapping myself with these things. She chides, pointing at her gorgeous round breasts. But I'm just not an underwear person. I never wear it. I let out a deep groan as I grip the counter and bring my nose right into the crook of her neck. I need her scent all over me. And the idea that every time I've seen her, for years, she's never worn underwear, it's enough to bring me to my knees. All the more reason to get the rest of these clothes off, honey. But if it makes you uncomfortable, I can give you one of my shirts. I'd like that, she whispers, a silent plea in her eyes. We might have gone hard and heavy, but we might need to take it back a step. Smiling, I head across the living room and down the hall, grabbing one of my plaid sweaters and bringing it back into the kitchen. When I round the corner, she's standing there in the afternoon light. I'm struck by the beauty of her body. She's intoxicatingly feminine, all soft curves and gentle slopes. God damn, Liv. You're gonna be the death of me. 
Just let me look at you for one minute. It's a plea and a command rolled into one, but she's not unaffected by it. She drops the shirt and tucks her hair up over one shoulder, letting me see every inch of beautiful, freckled skin. Crossing the room in a hurry, I toss my sweater over a chair and sink down onto it, pulling Liv into my lap. She goes to cross her arms over her stomach, but I move them. I want to see all of you, Liv. You are enough to make my mouth water. You don't need a minute? She jokes as I smirk. Another way alphas are a little different, sweetheart. We go harder, longer, more. I could fuck you ten times and still be ready the moment you need me. That part, I suppose, is a gift. Liv's nipples pebble as she arches her back into my chest. Reaching around behind her, I fumble for the clasp of her bra. May I? I look into her eyes, showing her my need, feeling it start to build in a bond she and I are going to share now that we're connecting. Liv nods and I unclip the bra fast, pulling it off her long arms and tossing it onto the floor. Freckled skin gives way to dusky, blush nipples, hardened into rose points that brush against my chest as she sucks in a breath. Touch me, please, Thatch. Please, Alpha, I demand. Already the Alpha-Omega bond is building in my chest, allowing me to sense her emotion and her need. It'll keep growing the longer I touch her, the deeper we connect. And if we seal it with a claiming bite, I'll be able to find her anywhere. I'll be able to read her thoughts and send her my own. It's a soul-deep connection I've wanted with her since the moment I laid eyes on her three years ago. I eat up the view in front of me. Big, heavy breasts morph into a curvaceous tummy, a dark patch of curls barely visible between thick thighs. Everything about you is so fucking feminine, I purr. It's been driving me mad since the day I met you. Liv chuckles as she reaches up and grips both her breasts, stroking the tips as I groan. Want to know what I thought the day we met? I grunt my assent as I watch her pull her nipples into stiff peaks, slick already coating my lap. When you walked in, all I could think about was you pulling me up over the counter, into your big arms, and having your way with me right there on the countertop. The mental image sends a spark flying down to the base of my spine as heat builds between my thighs. Tell me more, Liv. What did you want me to do to you? I wanted your mouth on me everywhere. She moans, arching her back as I run both hands up the center of it and pull her close to me. My lips close over one nipple, her fingers still pinching it. I suck hard, pulling her fingertips into my mouth, then guiding her hand back behind her body. Returning to her nipple, I bite at it gently, then harder, testing the limits of what feels good for her. Everything I do results in a fresh rush of slick from her, so I push a little more, sinking my teeth lightly into her breast, pulling at the tender flesh as Liv yips. But that yip turns into a deep huff when I bite the other breast the same way. My girl likes a little bit of pain. Good. I grip her hair tight, and my lips hover over hers for half a second, gazing into those beautiful eyes. I lean in, gripping her throat as I nip at her lower lip, which sends Liv squirming in my lap. Stop teasing me, she gasps. I'm losing my mind, Thatch. Not in the edging, I take it. I huff out a laugh as I thread my fingers through her hair and pull, bearing her slender neck to me. I bite my way down it as she rocks her hips against me, trying desperately to get what she wants. Fuck edging, Liv snarls. Save that for the second date. Right now I need more. Please, Alpha. The please Alpha does me in as I haul her back upright and silence her with my kiss. Alphas aren't tender lovers. We're whirlwind forces of nature, and the bedroom is no different. I suck at Liv's tongue as the bond between us grows and builds until I can feel it in my chest like a tangible thing. She gasps when I send my need through it, pushing lust into that dazzling connection. What? What the fuck was that? She questions, rubbing at a spot just above her heart. Our bond, I growl, standing with her in my arms and stalking to my bed. I toss her in before she can say anything, slapping her ass hard and watching it jiggle as she yowls. I grip both thick hips and haul her to the edge of the bed, burying my face between her thighs. 
Her yowl morphs into a pleading moan when my tongue finds that sweet spot nestled between her pussy lips. The tether between us yanks and pulls tight as Liv's pleasure grows. I'm alpha enough to recognize. This means she's fated to be mine. And that knowledge sends my pleasure into overdrive. Being mine means I get to bite her, claim her, not her. It means there will never be anyone else for either of us. I work Liv over as she pants, squirming and tightening as her hands fist the sheets. Not ten seconds later, she explodes in a rush of slick. It coats my lips and chin, sliding down my neck onto my stomach. I'm so hot from this, I'm nearly ready to come too, so I flip her over and slide my cock through the wet, swollen folds of her pussy. Liv gasps and groans, reaching down to stroke me as I thrust. She's all wet heat, her cheeks flushed from release as she sits up on one elbow and plays with my cockhead. She rubs at me with a sly smirk, and then heat barrels down our bond as she sends her need to me. Catching on fast, mate, I snarl as she focuses on that bond, using that connection to build the fire between my thighs. Orgasm hits me before she even responds, and I bellow into the room as my cock pulses and shoots come all over her pretty neck and chest and stomach. I grip her soft hips as I spurt and tremble and roar, until I'm drained of seed and my pretty little Omega is absolutely covered in cum. When red-hot pleasure finally recedes, I look down, masculine pride threading its way along our bond. What a fucking sight to behold. Live in my bed, covered in my spend, smiling at me because she's sated from an orgasm I gave her. I could get used to this. She smiles up at me. You called me mate. Live. There's sex, and then there's sex with an alpha. And once you've had the latter, you could never possibly go back to the former. There isn't a sex toy or normal human in the world with a tongue like Thatcher's. And then he called me mate. The second he said it, that weird connection in my chest I've always felt, it burned hot with need. The rightness of him is buried in my soul. I need him like I've always known I did. Thatcher stiffens when I comment on him calling me mate. After sliding his gorgeous, still hard cock away, he grabs a towel and comes back. What's wrong? Did you not mean to call me that? He frowns. I did, but it's the most extreme possible example of zero to sixty, Liv. Alpha's mate for life. We're intense, and I'm attempting to hold some of that back because I don't want to terrify you. That slipped out. My smile just grows bigger. So you do believe I'm your mate, then? That we should be bonded forever? Dark eyes flick up to mine, wary. Yes. He purrs, his deep baritone traveling straight between my thighs. Good, I bark back, because I've thought of you that way every fucking day for three years, and hearing you say it to me makes me so happy. The edges of Thatch's mouth curl up into a smile. So you're saying it doesn't terrify you that I want to give you my claiming bite, that I want to knot you and fill you with cum and have a million babies? I huff out a laugh. I'm down with most of that, but what the hell is a knot? Thatcher leans down, gently wiping cum off my neck and chest. I'm going to let you learn about that one in a moment, I think. I'm a big fan of edging and teasing, you see. My knot's going to feel so good inside you, Liv. When he gets most of the cum off me, he leans down and licks up the rest, working over my nipples, underneath my breasts, the top of my stomach. It's so hot watching him that I flood the bed with wetness again. I'd be weirded out if it didn't seem so natural with him and if he didn't seem so turned on by it. When he's happy with my state of cleanliness, he pulls me upright. I want to feed you some dinner, and then I want you to stay here because a storm is coming in, and I need to hold you. Perfect, I whisper as he leans in, slicking his mouth over mine for another incredible kiss. I never realized how sexy it could be for a man to cook, but Thatch pulls on gray sweatpants, giving me one of his shirts again, and he props me up on the counter while he does everything. He whips together spaghetti sauce, his mother's recipe, which includes pesto, and then boils pasta to go along with it. 
I set the table with a little bit of direction on where things are, and then we sit down with a bottle of wine and a beautiful dinner. We talk about everything. My family back in Gatlinburg, his down on the Carolina coast. We talk about the day he transitioned into an alpha, and how he thought the town would turn against him. But nobody ever did, because he was still the same old Thatcher, just <laughs> a little bigger. Eventually the heat between us ramps up again until I tackle him in the chair. When we make it back to the bedroom, Thatcher laughs as he peppers my shoulder with kisses. I see what you're angling for, little Omega. You want to get fucked by an alpha. But I'm not going to do that until I've taken you on an honest-to-God date. So let's do that tomorrow, all right? I shouldn't let disappointment settle so hard into my soul, but it does. I'll make it up to you. He growls in my ear, running his big arm around my waist so he can slide down and pepper kisses along my hip bone, and lower. I'll take you up on that date. I snarl back as his mouth closes on my clit and sucks. God, you're good at that. I know. He chuckles. Thatcher I wake in the night with a stunning Omega in my arms, snoring lightly. Her ass is pressed right up against my lap, and I'm hard as granite feeling her. I said I wasn't going to fuck her until I had a chance to take her out, but I'm regretting that decision right now. There's nothing I want to do more than wake her up with my lips and teeth, and not her until she's bonded to me permanently. <sighs> Zero to sixty indeed. The bond between us is growing, so she senses I'm awake and needy and stirs, rocking her hips back against mine. She moans, turning and opening her thighs so I can slide my dick right between them. Omega Slick coats me, forming a natural lubricant as she rocks her hips along me. I swear I feel every drop of blood rush to my groin as she starts to wake, rocking her hips faster, getting that friction of my hard length against her clit. I tease and taste her until she's wide awake, demanding her pleasure from me. She is fucking perfect. An hour later, Liv holds a coffee and looks out the window at the gray horizon. Looks like snow. Shit, I still need to go to work today. Concern rises in my chest. Not today, Liv. Stay with me. It's gonna snow a shitload. We'll do a date and... She smiles at me. I've got to head in for a few hours at least. Everybody will be by to pick up their meds if it does start snowing. It, it held off last night, so Sally will expect me in today for sure. It's a bad idea, Omega. I murmur, glancing out the window at the horizon. I can smell snow coming. You can smell the snow, she deadpans with a wry expression before sighing. Honestly, I'd believe just about anything at this point. What do you mean? I murmur as I turn to her and nip her shoulder along her collarbone, up the side of her neck to her ear. Liv reaches down and grabs my hand, pulling it up to her chest, where she lays it flat over her heart. I feel you, here, tied to me even stronger than the day we met. That means something, right? Green eyes scan my face as I nod slowly, unsure how much to dive into this. She showed up here less than a day ago. Liv seems content with my answer, smiling as she looks back out the window. I love it, she whispers, glancing over at me with a shy smile. I pull her into my arms and devour her mouth, pouring my need and desire into that tender tether that threads stronger every time we get close. Stay with me and get snowed in. We can do a date here. I was distracted and forgot about the storm when I said we should go out. I'll make it worth your while. Oh, I have no doubt she chirps. Let me just go in for a couple of hours, and I'll make sure we close down early. I'll be back before you know it, and I'm taking you up on that date. I grumble again, but agree. Come home safe, and I'll spoil you rotten. Sounds perfect, Liv whispers. She sets her coffee down and dresses, heading for her car despite one more plea from me that she simply stay. I know how dedicated she is to her customers, though. She manages their medications, and for some folks, going without for a day or two could be catastrophic. I admire her tenacity and care, even though I'm worried over the weather. I watch Liv head down my gravel driveway after refusing to let me drive her in, and then I return to my woodpile from yesterday. God, was it just last night I was doing this chore when she pulled up with that basket of cookies? 
I finished that task, making sure there's plenty stocked under the porch, but also inside next to the fireplace. I stick close to the house all morning, keeping my radio nearby in case anyone calls for help. The snow starts coming down around lunch, but when I call the pharmacy to check on Liv, nobody answers. They must be slammed. Two hours later, snow coats the yard, and there's still nobody picking up at the pharmacy. My senses prickle with the need to move, to seek. Liv should have been home by now. She said she was just going in for a few hours. Something's wrong. I rub at my chest as energy builds there. Find her, find her, find her. My alpha intuition urges me as I grab my keys and hop in the truck. It takes me far longer than I'd like to pick my way into town, but I don't see Liv's car. When I get to the pharmacy, it's not there either. Shit. The only thing I can think is she might have tried going to her place. There's only one road up to mine, and I just came down it. Backing out of the parking lot, I head in the direction of Liv's house, tapping my foot as I roll down the window to scent for her. The likelihood of me getting close enough to find her by smell isn't that great, but if she's close to the road, I might be able to. I round a corner in the highway, and my eyes widen in horror. Snow. An unbelievable amount of snow coats the road and trails off the other side. An avalanche. I can't see a single car buried underneath, but I know she's in there. I just know it. Throwing the truck into park, I grab a shovel out of the back and sprint up the enormous drift, looking for any signs of a car or anything at all. I run from one side to the other. There's so much fucking snow. My vision narrows, focusing like a predator's would, and I pause to listen to scent. I need to find my girl. There. The faint ring of a car alarm is muffled by the snow. Sprinting down the snowdrift, over the side of the highway, I slide down toward a ravine as the sound of the alarm gets louder. I get as close as I can, hollering for Liv as I start digging. I throw every ounce of my alpha weight into the shovel until the head cracks and breaks clean off under the strain. Snarling, I let my claws come out and use them to stab into the snow until I can see the roof of a car. Liv! Liv, baby, I'm here! I roar for her as I dig the snow out from around her sunroof, looking inside. What I see stops my heart. One entire side of Liv's car is bent in, her ankle crushed between the car door and the center console. Her face is pale and drawn, coated with sweat despite the cold. Green eyes flutter open when she hears me, a slight smile parting her lips. Hang on, baby girl, I croon. Cover your face, Liv. Using a tool for my keychain, I pick the sunroof open enough to get my fingers in, and then I rip the entire thing off the roof of Liv's car. She gasps when the cold air hits her. Sliding my upper body into the sunroof, I push on the crushed side of the car enough to free her ankle as she hisses in pain. God, that's it hurts so much, she whimpers. But I don't think it's broken, just hurts like hell. She wiggles her foot, then gives me a thumbs up. Reaching down, I slide my arms underneath her tense figure and lift her gently out of the sunroof. Then I hike back up the snowbank with Liv tucked into my arms, her face buried in my neck as she thanks me over and over again. You need a hospital, I growl as I strap her carefully into the front seat. Take me to your place, she barks back. I just need rest. I'll be fine. I debate taking her to the hospital anyhow, but it's a solid three hours from here, and the snow continues to rage. I head for home instead. We'll ice and elevate her ankle and see what we're working with. Liv is quiet the whole way, drifting in and out of wakefulness, tucked right up against my chest. When we get back to my place... I take her gently out of the car and ensconce her in front of the fireplace with an ice pack on her ankle. She stirs enough to sip some hot chocolate and eat a little bit of leftover spaghetti, but then she falls asleep as I watch her. Never letting you go, Liv, I think to myself. You are mine, baby girl. Liv I waked the crackling of logs in the fireplace, blinking my eyes open to watch as Thatcher stuffs fresh wood into the hearth. Thick muscles move under his flannel as I soak it all in, just imagining those big muscles on top of me this morning. God, was that just this morning? 
I move to sit up, the throb in my ankle intensifying as I hiss in a breath, causing Thatch to turn. He crosses the room and drops to his knees in front of me, lifting the ice pack to eye my still swollen ankle. How's it feel? He murmurs, setting the pack aside and unwrapping my leg. My ankle is black and blue and it hurts, but the swelling is down a little since he pulled me out of the car. Fucking snow, I curse as his eyes shoot up. Normally I'm not much of a cursor, but it's warranted in this case, absolutely warranted. Thatch's lips split into a smile as he stands and grabs another ice pack from the fridge, returning quietly across the cabin. I smile as I watch him drop to his knees again and replace the ice pack and towel around my ankle. He's so handsome I can barely stand it. Slick wets my thighs as he runs his fingertips along my lower leg, glancing up at me. You need rest, Omega, he murmurs as I shift in the seat, stepping my good leg out wide. I ache, Alpha. I purr back at him, rolling my hips as he slides forward on the ground, hovering over my torso. His deep baritone caresses my skin. Where are you hurt, Liv? Reaching forward, I grip his fingertips and bring them between my thighs. Here, Alpha, I need you here. Thatch snarls and strokes between my legs, and I'm thankful that sometime between this afternoon and now, my pants have disappeared. I don't think you're up for the rowdy time I'd like to have with you, he purrs, leaning in to drag his nose up between my thighs. Although you smell good enough to eat, Liv. Not Liv. I correct, feeling for that bond between us and tugging on it mentally. Mate, I know it and you know it, and there's no point denying it. Thatcher's eyes narrow. Do you know what you're asking me, Omega? Bonding an alpha means it's you and I forever. No turning back, no changing your mind. It means I'll be buried deep in here. He reaches out with one huge hand and lays a palm flat over my heart, eyes focused on me. But I don't hesitate, because he's been buried inside my heart since the day he first came into the pharmacy and smiled at me with those damn dimples. Every second I've had to spend away from you for three years was torture, mate, I whisper. I want everything you've got, and I'm yours in every way you want me. Thatcher loops both arms under me, taking care not to jostle my leg as he strides for the bedroom and lays me down. He's being careful and I respect his naturally protective nature, but I need more. I need your alpha side, Thatch, I tease. Stop being so gentle with me. Nostrils flare as his eyes widen, my alpha taking on a slightly different stance as he eyes me in his bed. You sure, baby girl? I don't want to hurt you. You won't, I whisper. Thatcher's eyes don't leave mine as he unbuttons his flannel and tosses it aside. His pants come off next, and then he's standing in front of me, seven feet of stacked alpha male. He licks his lips as his gaze travels from my face, down my body, and back up. It's practically a physical caress as he strokes our mental bond. I can't help but arch my back as pleasure travels between us, heightening the sensation of lying in Thatcher's sheets, I strip my shirt off so there's nothing between us, gasping when I feel his lips close over one nipple, sharp teeth tugging at it gently before he licks away the slight stab of pain. Please, Alpha, I beg as Thatcher kisses his way across my chest, giving the other side the same treatment. Please what? He barks, his dominance washing over me like a touch. I'm too turned on to put coherent thoughts together as he nips his way up my chest and along my collarbone, chuckling. I want to hear your words, mate. Please, Alpha, fuck me. Or please, Thatcher, I'm so wet for you. How about, bite me, Alpha. Make me yours. I gasp at his suggestions. I want all of that, mate. Bite me, fuck me, bond me now. I infuse as much growl as I can into my demand. Thatcher's eyes lock onto mine as his lips hover just above my mouth. When they crash down onto me, I'm unprepared for the physical and mental onslaught of an alpha driven to the edge of need. Thatcher is everywhere, sucking at my tongue, nipping at my lips, his need thrashing down the bond between us until every inch of my body is on fire and desperate. One big arm wraps around my waist as Thatcher nudges my knees apart, 
taking care to keep his weight off my bad leg. I need to prepare you, baby girl, he groans. I'm so big, but I can feel your need so hard right now. I'm soaked, Thatcher, I gasp back. I'm ready for you, mate. Thatcher reaches down, thick fingers finding my clit, and rubbing it gently before he dips them inside, feeling how ready I am. I pant when he grips the head of his cock and guides it through my folds, coating himself in slick until he's dripping with it. Then he positions himself between my thighs and slides partially in. Heat erupts in my core, sparks skating down my spine as pleasure rockets through me. His pleasure at feeling me for the first time and mine at experiencing the thickness of my alpha mate. More, I gasp out. Hard, please. Thatcher grunts and glances at my leg as I hold back a snarl. Stop worrying and fuck me. He laughs, hauling me up into his arms and stalking to the nearest wall, pressing me up against it with my thighs spread wide, my ankles safely out to one side. Then he leans in and nips at my shoulder as he lowers me down onto his cock, moaning as he slides in without issue. And then he's filling me so completely, I don't know where I stop and he begins. I'm stretched wide around him, panting and gasping for breath around pleasure I never could have imagined. Thatcher is everywhere, his scent, his mouth, his desire. Our bond burns bright in my mind's eye as he slides out and back in, heavy balls slapping up against me with the force of his thrust. You wanted it hard, baby girl? His deep voice teases me as I whine and try to rock my hips harder into him, but like this, I'm not in charge, I can't move. Bite me, I demand, baring my neck for him. I'm working on instinct, the instinct that begs my alpha mate to put his mark on me, to claim me and bond us permanently. Thatcher snarls as he picks up a punishing pace, thrusting rhythmically as I pant and pray and gasp his name over and over. My entire body coils and tightens, my core pulsing with the need to explode around him as Thatcher growls in my ear, his lips tickling their way along my neckline. Come for me, Liv. Soak my cock with your sweet honey, baby girl. Orgasm hits me with the force of a hurricane as fireworks splash across my vision, my entire body convulsing and shaking around my mate. He continues to pound me into the wall as I scream, and then the sharp pinch of teeth surprises me, shoving me over the edge into deeper pleasure, sparks sizzling up our bond. I sense doors open deep in my mind, and then that bond burns like a bonfire, and he's there. He's everywhere. I feel him threaded into my mind and body in a way I can barely comprehend. Thatcher roars into the bond as he falls with me his hips crushing mine with short, jerky movements as my back continues to thump against the wall. When he slows, I blink my eyes open, feeling his fangs slip out of my shoulder, his forehead coming to rest on mine. I open my mouth to say something, anything, but I can't think of a single damn appropriate response. I know, baby girl, he chuckles, nuzzling my nose with his before kissing his way along my lower lip. I know. You are perfection. Absolute fucking perfection. Thatcher. Live. My mate. Mine. Possessive dominance shoots through my system when I look at the way Liv's eyes meet mine, need and lust still evident in her heated gaze. She wants more, even though I'm sure her leg hurts. She's not complaining about it, but she's got to be tender. Stop thinking and fuck me again, she demands, dragging her nails down my chest as my dick jumps inside her. Being an alpha, I'm made for dominating her in the bedroom. I've worried over her ankle, but when she's all better, I'll give her the ride of her life. She chuckles, sensing my thoughts now that we're tied together. Snoop, I chide her through the bond. You're wide open, alpha, she teases back. I'm not done. I need more. I laugh out loud at that, full of the bright joy that comes with bonding my Omega. I'm gonna not you, sweet girl. Think you're ready for that. Liv whines and rocks her hips up against me. I'm a thousand percent ready for that. 
Don't know what it is, but if it's some magical mystery alpha shit, I want it. Give it to me. Laughing again, I tuck her into my chest and stalk to the sofa, keeping her seated on top of me. Gonna help you ride me until I can knot you, mate. I snarl into her ear, licking the mating bite and relishing the way she shudders around my cock. And I do. I take her half a dozen times before that need boils down to a steady simmer, and she's ready for sleep. The next morning I wake to pleasure rocketing through my system. My mate bond is tight with need, Liv's excitement waking me and amping up my own desire for her. Grumbling, I blink my eyes open to find a fucking sight. Liv on all fours, her thick thighs and sweet pussy right in my face as she sucks the tip of my cock deep into her throat. I hiss as I run my hands up her thighs, watching the way she tightens for me as I touch her. Leaning forward, I sit up and grip her hips so I can pull her sweet pussy to my mouth, and then I eat her while she sucks on me, until we're both a sticky, sated mess. Hours later, I tuck her in front of the fireplace with a hot chocolate as I open the fridge. What are we going to do with all this snow? She muses, glancing out the window as I laugh. We're snowed in, baby girl. Not a lot to do but fuck and eat and then fuck some more. Liv chuckles, heat traveling up our bond as goosebumps break out along my shoulders. Growling, I turn to my beautiful mate, watching her bat her eyelashes, feigning innocence as I cross the room, tipping her chin up so I can get a good look. I'm trying to feed you, woman. Give me a minute. Liv smiles again and sips at her hot chocolate. But as I cross the room to dive back into the fridge, a mental image of me fucking the sex toy with her on the counter slams into me. Was it just a day or two ago we did that? I turn to find Liv crossing the room, grabbing the toy from its hiding place, and slapping it down on the counter next to me. She hobbles around me and hops up onto the countertop, spreading her thighs wide. I'm not hungry for food, Alpha. I've got other ideas about how to spend a couple hours. What do you think? Chuckling, I pull my shirt over my head and smile. I like your ideas, baby girl. How do you feel about adding a few more toys to the mix? Liv gasps and blushes, but smiles as she nods at me. What did you have in mind, mate? I open the drawer next to her leg, and when she looks down, she laughs. It's beautiful and joyous and seductive as she reaches in and pulls out a pair of electrodes. Oh, yes, she murmurs, holding up one end and examining the control box. This will do nicely. The end. Welcome back. Hey, thank you so much, Anna, for bringing your book to us this week. This was awesome. It's just, I'm so thankful that we met and that you were able to write a book for the podcast and we had you on here and it was just, it was a great moment. And I hope one day that we can meet again and I can give you a big giant hug and tell you thanks in person. So um, make sure you join us next week. We have a brand new book from Casey Rose. It's called Saving Mason. So and we're like, we're getting down to the wire on this one. So mm -hmm. I'm super excited. But yeah, we've got Casey Rose next week. And we'll tell you all about that then. All right. Tell us too. Fuck your day up. Make sure you're bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me